Hello, guys. Welcome to the weekly call. Uh, today, we're going to do the normal schedule of product updates and recaps of the calls, but we're also going to have crypto locally and Fuse talk a little bit about their projects as they're interested in listing on Mesa. So I guess um, to start off here, we do a quick update on Omen. Uh, Corpus, do you want to go ahead? Yes, uh, Omen version 1.1.6 was released on Wednesday. Um, I promised, like, actually a, a new version with um, substantial uh, changes, uh, which was the case, at least is my view. Um, we pushed out uh, a curation integration, which means Omen will only show valid market uh, as default uh, listing criteria. Uh, the curation is done by the DXDAO and Kleros. So um, if someone is adding a valid market to Kleros, it will be shown. If someone is adding a valid market th uh, to, through the DXDAO curation, which is like, which needs to go through a proposal, it will be shown. But everything else needs to be like, opt in by the user. So the user actually needs to like go to filter section and say like, I want to see all markets, even like the potential invalid ones. So that like with that, like we are probably the, a true decentralized prediction market, which takes care of like the, the validity, the correctness of the markets, which is like, which hopefully boosts the user experience dramatically because we are not showing like crazy warnings about okay, this, this, is, this is potentially a invalid market and the user needs to do the heavy lifting. So we are actually doing the heavy lifting and all the markets on default will be with a high chance, hopefully valid. Um, because there are like also edge cases where a market uh, is valid now, but may not be valid in two weeks because something happened and some some t like some specific event got pushed back into some unknown date, which makes the market invalid. So that is a very important feature, which is uh, on dxtest.eth.link um, can be tested. Caden, uh, our like uh, main developer for Omen, also worked on a, um, a life cycle progress bar uh, mm -hmm. and like a overall market overview widget, which is like primarily read only and just gives uh, gives the user like a compact view of the, the life cycle and the current state of the market and like how the market can progress. Um, and that's like a very important thing uh, because right, like previously the user actually didn't know at all how the market resolves and what are the next steps. So that that's like a, a first step and we have like a lot a lot of stuff to do to like make it even better and the the next point is like we had a 24 hour trading volume shown which wasn't really correct it was like a half back solution uh, but we fixed it on the subgraph and now we actually have a real 24 hour trading volume finally and the last point uh, is that the users actually like voted on that we show on default uh, a market overview salt criteria, salt criteria as uh, like highest liquidity. People actually like care more about high, uh, highest liquidity of a market um, compared to 24 hour trading volume. So that's it. Uh, for the next version, I hope to see like the gelato integration and several other things which may be developed and integrated. Great, thank you, Corcus. Uh, let's move to Mesa. Uh, Mesa, on the product side, there isn't a new release, but work is underway to make the UI more of a traditional order book focused UI, as opposed now where you kind of have the order book in a modal. Um, so I think that's kind of the big, the big effort now. And then I think probably the biggest news is um, in addition to Gnosis sending 10,000 OWL for 
the MTA sale, which is arguably the first revenue for DXDAO. It's, it's now in the treasury. Um, they've also shared a, an incentive program, um, which has a, uh, a max goal of, of up to 200 million trading volume by the end of the year. If that's reached uh, 2000 GNO, would be sent to uh, DXDAO treasury. And kind of like, if that's not reached, it's a gradiated um, kind of scale not quite linear, but basically the more trading volume, the more GNO. Uh, Ken, I don't know, do you want to add anything on, on Mesa? We also have a couple projects uh, going to talk after the updates about potential listings. Yeah, thank you, Jonah. I, I don't have anything to add today, I think. Great. Um, awesome. <laughs> and uh, I guess we'll move along here uh, to DX Swap. Augusto, do you want to take that one? Hola, yes. Uh, we just had a very productive call organizing, uh, start organizing the, a group of people that is going to be working around DX Swap, where currently we were only just uh, Nico and me. Um, yeah, we are. We were talking about how. What are we going to do with a new design, like the like Uniswap launch? If we are going to merge it, which features are we going to uh, are, are we going to integrate? On the um, on the code level, nothing was done uh, besides the DX swap deployer uh, smart contract. The idea is to, I mean, based on the launch parameters and the and the launch. A strategy that, that we came up, I wrote a DXOP deployer, a smart contract, and I'm, go, and I'm going to be writing the test for it. Once that is done, I'm going to be sharing it on DAO talk. And well, uh, there is being talk that maybe we get it out there. And, and yeah, we might want to decide if we do a back panty or we share it in the community because we saw it on Susie Schwab. A lot of people, even, uh, even us, even myself, started like a like like a hunt on trying to find a vulnerability on the on the migration we are we almost find it so that idea i think that that's what we want to incentivize the rest of the of the developers of the of the hackers in space to try to break the dx app deployer smart contract and find any vulnerability and receive a reward for it so yeah that would be the the way forward uh, and then the other thing is the integration between uh, DXDAO governance and DXSwap has been audited. The audit was received, so that's being kind of processed right now and will be shared, uh, I think, more publicly once you know once it's been processed by the dev team. Um, yeah. In, and then, yeah. Interesting about that is that it can also we can also add other contracts that we want to uh, interact with. So it's it's a skin that can be uh, reused a lot. For example, right now we have four schemes related to ENS on our on, on our governance system. Maybe we can put all the same addresses under one scheme. So we use one scheme to govern all the ENS ENSs to communicate with the registry, with the registry with fallback, yada yada yada. So uh, yeah. it can be used to up uh, to upgrade uh, in on a certain level, our, our entire governance infrastructure, which is good. And this, this sets the groundwork for doing treasury management, right? Like we can then, uh, you know, finally DXNet will be able to, you know, convert non-ETH revenue into ETH and send it to the bonding curve. It will be able to diversify the ETH holdings, uh, potentially like into stable coins or whatever is, is kind of deemed best there. So yeah, progress being made along, along that front. Um, all right, that's the swap uh, rails. I don't think Federico is the dev on that call. Dev, but Zet, I don't know. I mean, you could put, uh, maybe I don't know if he's on there and wants to handle it. But basically, rails is. Uh, feel free to jump in, Zet. But uh, I'll try to kind of synopsize what's happened, even though I'm not paying that great of attention. Uh, maybe actually Sky could could jump in here. But I yeah. think it's basically uh, ready. Yeah, go ahead, Sky. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, like we we kept testing it. Uh, Federico has uh, finished everything he had planned to finish. Um, I think he was just looking into like what to how to how to put like a footer because 
he was thinking about when you get to uh, rails.eth, it shows you like an information page and then you have to go into the app, which I suggested that you want rails.eth to be the app. And it's a pretty simple app. So I think it's pretty cool that you don't need any explanation. So like Omen, if you just get to rails.eth, that's the app. Now, if you want to go learn more information about it, you have to go to an about page or FAQ. I think we put that maybe at the bottom like we do with Omen. If everyone agrees that that's smart, then that's what I told him to do. And I think that's his plan. And so he's, I think it's basically going to be ready to go today. And so then we have to go through the, uh, you know, the proposal process and uh, getting it up onto IPFS. But I'll, I think I'll touch base with him sometime today. Uh, but it looks right. yeah. So so ready to go it means basically Federico will kind of mark the release, and then at that point, you know, it's it's set to for the community to uh, deploy and propose or whatnot. Um, very good. Uh, Anything else on on Rails? One other. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, real quick, uh, I, like Zoran uh, has written an article. Um, that's like kind of it's ready to to roll whenever um and i guess we're either like gonna wait for the for the ens um resolving first if it, if it can be really soon or i can just like uh launch it like today you know have, have them publish it today but it, we have something ready content wise um, yeah, uh, we've been working on Rails for about a week and a half now, and uh, the developer and the UI designer also checked out the texts, and I think somebody else contributed as well. So it's been pretty um, steamed over. Excellent, excellent. Do you guys think it makes sense to publish an article like warm, like with the idea of it, and then when it comes out, we pu publish a small post saying it's live? Or do you wait till it's yeah. live on Middle and then and then uh, publish the article? Right. I I think that like it'll be out like in probably ten days like at the quickest, right? So I I think that's like, too much time to wait. It'd be great to just publish this thing and say like this is what the product is going to be. It's happening really soon, and and like have another piece just announcing that that it, it's live. Um, you know, if, if we, sooner we publish, more it can build some hype and and all that for, for the launch. Alternatively, my, my alternatively, we could also do sort of a countdown and maybe publish some um, different information about the problems that it's going to solve and the importance of layer two and just to add some context and then eventually 10 days uh, after today once it releases just hit them with the main post that we over we've already prepared interesting i i guess i don't know which way i i lean i like announcing it now because it's so ready but i also don't want to lose that first like burst of attention where there's nowhere for them to click i'm almost Wondering if we could show the test app right now and say this is, you know, the test app, not ENS, not IP, just so we like some users are captured, especially if like, because it's so gas price dependent to onboard. I mean, right now is like a, a bad time to <laughs> onboard, but like who knows where we'll be in 10 days. Like it's almost worth 200 bucks and then your transactions are free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Your your grandkids will benefit from your onboarding costs. Yeah. Like so, I mean, uh, I don't know. So, I guess we could discuss this in the chat. One other consideration. This is a, a broader thing to to consider, though. As you may have seen, we well Federico uh, for Loopring abstracted uh, the order book UI into a swap UI. Um, we announced that a couple days ago. So, like swap.loopring.io is just um, you know a swap, a simple swap style interface that we all know, and it's pulling from the order books. It's not the forthcoming AMM in, in version three point six. But I'm just thinking because like that runs on the same rails, right? Uh, that swap. There's no difference to add that in uh, Federico's work uh, with the Rails branding. And then once you're on there, not only is it sending but it's like hey do you want to do a gas free transfer it's so like i think it's 
literally a completely low hanging fruit to, to add that in. The one I see negative is perhaps the product confusion versus DX swap. Although I think we could like delineate it and it's, you know, that like, I, I don't think that should be the blocker because it's like, if we have a product to add value to, to, to another product, let's not like stop that. But yeah, just to throw that out there, um, I haven't brought this, I, I, I brought this up to Federico a while ago, just in passing, but now given the timing that swap is done and rails is done, I wonder if we could just do that. And now is the time to do that since we're 10 days out. Um, or, you know, before the process, because imagine, you know, when you're on rails, you could also do a swap. It's quite a bigger audience um, and we, a lot more to talk about and, and push to the forefront. I think like Loopring swap got a lot of buzz and it was just a UI. People were, it was like, you know, uh, ostensibly a really popular release just because, oh, you could do a swap with no gas fees, um, even though it was just abstracting the order book. Uh, so I think people really like that. And yeah, that's that's it. I think there was actually a problem with that. Uh, I'm in a couple of communities about uh, loop ring swap because if people get got in from like external links and not from your blogs, uh, from loop ring blogs or whatever, they don't know that this is just an abstract off of uh, order book. So they almost get tricked into uh, believing it's a swap. But uh, mm. so I. I Remember when it came out, people were like talking shit, like, "Oh, this is just the interface uh, for their normal loopring exchange." And uh, I don't oh. think it was clear enough if you just got into the swap from from like external sources. Uh, sure. So that was uh, like even me, I, I was confused, and then I went on and read, and now I'm like, "Oh, this is not the the right. promised AMM." Uh, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, so first of all, I fully agree with that. That's in the in the initial. I mean, it was just a tweet, but we say this is not an AMM. Like literally, it says it three different ways. This abstracts the this UI abstracts the books. The, to be clear, this is not the upcoming AMM functionality. But yeah, so I completely agree. At the end of the day, though, it shouldn't yeah. be a trick. Imagine in a future world where order books are actually more liquid than the naive curve because more professional market makers are on Ethereum on layer two, then, then it's no longer a trick, right? They're happy to be swapping with the best price. The fact that does, that, 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 that doesn't come from a pool, that it comes from abstracted order books, it's not a trick in my mind. Although I do see what you're saying, but like a swap is just the UI. They don't care how the order is being routed, that it's going into a pool or that there's a there's um, uh, a professional market maker on the back that, that has improved the order books, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, the slippage could be much, much higher if it's an order book, right? Like the, the, the price is dependent on what people choose to sell, uh, both on the buys and the sells, right? So yeah, in that right. sense, I think like you could try to sell and buy and then then the price is like, the order book is just, uh, uh, yeah. But the... Uh, uh, just go back on the if if we I mean I thought about this like uh, uh, Rails is a DX DAO product and it should be branded like one so uh, getting uh, let's say if, if uh, we link two Rails from from uh, uh, the Loopring swap thing I think it should be I th I don't think it's a problem just uh, I don't think people understand. The connection between Rails and Loopring exactly, uh, but I think we could just make it clearer some way that, that this is powered by Loopring yeah. or something. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like there's some some stuff we can iron out on the communication and kind of the, the launch of, of this on. Um... Right. So look, we, we could take that offline, Zed. I, I agree on all the points. To be clear, though, what I'm saying is that uh, the swap functionality will just become another thing you could do on Rails. There'll be a transfer and there will be a trade the same way that rails runs on loop like we don't have this isn't loop ring swap just a rails product right it's a swap thing and again, just back to the other point there could be worse slippage but there also could be better slippage to be clear right now there's definitely worse slippage than any amm because loop rings order books aren't the most liquid things in the world but if you were pulling from binance order books you would have 
a deep, you would have less slippage on most pairs than you do even on Uniswap or things like that. And I'm just trying to say that order books in the long run, I actually believe outcompete AMMs. That's my personal opinion. Some people share it, some people don't. But slippage need not be worse on an order book thing. It could be, it could be better, right? The same way you see price impact on Uniswap, that your price impact is going to be 50 beeps. Uh, that could be 20 beeps on an order book if there was a, if there was a tighter quote. But yeah, this this is all interesting to talk in private. And thanks for your points. I I, I definitely see them and agree. Thank you. Yeah, I think being uh, transparent about the slippage obviously would, sounds like an important thing. And there's probably details that we don't have time here to work out. So let's follow up on all of this uh, in the chat, you know, etc. Right. Uh, it's great to see so many people coming together on Rails and. Uh, you know, I think people who are paying attention to the extent understand how far this community has come in just a few months, right? Like, uh, I don't know if people realize that, but like the level at which the extent is ramping up is is pretty amazing here. Um, I want to talk more about governance side products, but I think just because of time, let's move and give Mark from Fuse the stage. He was supposed to have time in the governance call, but as sometimes happens, uh, things went a bit over and you know there's that kind of uh, great debate happening around Delphi's yeah. presentation. So let's let's kind of hand it over to Mark from Fuse and I'll just kind of let you introduce yourself and uh, you got about 10 minutes and we'll go to crypto locally after after that. Great. So thank you and uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. Cool. So uh, yeah I was I was is is dropping um yesterday on the call so uh, exciting stuff and uh, uh, talked to a bunch of people uh, at DXDAO and uh, it's really exciting to see uh, like an implementation of a DAO from from the inside uh, definitely like it's rare um, so uh, it's rare that it works it's it's rare that it, uh, you know um, that it can uh, actually you know uh, be a, a, a something that you can replicate but so far there weren't like too many good examples I'll give a, a brief uh, um, a brief uh, overview about Fuse. So, and then I'll talk a bit about like the the background for this and and also the pilots, but mainly uh, why we why we need DXDAO and Mesa and why why we chose this. So, um, the company is uh, one year old. We raised money last year, uh, but the team goes way back uh, uh, four years. Uh, we're working together, um, and this is actually my fourth company. Uh, in total, that deals with uh, with that deals in, in online payments and specifically third company in crypto. Uh, so uh, my first company I started when I bought my first Bitcoin it was 2013, uh, and then we did uh, we tried to 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 uh, get acceptance for uh, Bitcoin for payments, like you could pay, pay uh, with Bitcoin at a pub and and pay, pay for beer with this. And then we realized it's a it's a stupid uh, you know. Uh, concept like nobody wants to pay with Bitcoin for a beer, um, uh, like it's very um, um, like it's basically like trying to pay uh, for beer with your Facebook stock or with gold or something. So it's it's just like not not something that uh, there's too much demand for. Um, and then we thought what we, we can do with the technology. It was really early stage. We started a company called Colu, which uh, did the, the colored coins protocol, which was. Uh, the let's call it the Bitcoin version of Ethereum before Ethereum existed. So it, it was part uh, part of the team was uh, Vitalik. It was incubated at uh, Itoro, uh, and Vitalik uh, the, the blasphemous thing of uh, forking uh, of like creating a new blockchain. But back then there was no blockchain industry, and uh, there was only Bitcoin industry. And we called ourselves Bitcoin 2.0. Uh, and the, the company tried to push this for consumer adoption, just like a low overlay protocol on top of Bitcoin, tried to uh, to create products on top of it, wallets, explorers. And uh, it's, uh, that approach uh, failed very fast. Um, and back then, it wasn't really mature enough to, to create those sorts of products. So we looked into a lot of different technologies, and then we're in Hyperledger, Lightning, uh, we came to uh, Ethereum, and then the last four years uh, we're on top of Ethereum. That's uh, primarily uh, um, what we're building on. And, and Fuse is really everything we learned in the past uh, eight years in this space. Um, uh, how to use this technology, how to use non-custodial wallets, open source infrastructure to deliver payments and, and to replace Visa. 
So uh, I'm talking about visa, but uh, actually we're, we're targeting more places that don't have visa. So most of the world doesn't have visa. Uh, South, Africa, uh, uh, South America, Africa, Asia, uh, the plan is to bring this technology to places where, um, where people still use cash and have smartphones, uh, give mobile payments uh, basically for free uh, for any local operator that wants to use it. Uh, so basically taking something that costs millions of dollars and, and uh, uh, give this for to entrepreneurs for free, um, just pay on-chain fees. And instead of uh, paying uh, Visa 1% or Stripe or Square uh, or PayPal, uh, you can basically charge per uh, how much data you put in the, in the blockchain. Or, you, or, or it doesn't matter if you move million dollars or one dollar, you always pay the same cost on fuels. And uh, it doesn't really make sense to, to use uh, Ethereum to buy a uh, coffee or to send allowance to your kids, or there's some use cases that just don't make sense on a global settlement network. So uh, we try to build a vertical integration and optimize for one specific use case, which is simple P2P transfers. So how can we deliver a, a good payment experience for non-crypto users? Uh, uh, using a blockchain, using all this technology to lower cost. And this is not really something too many companies focus on, but open source code can actually be a good infrastructure, especially if it's something that has an ecosystem and standards. Um, so um, we want to deploy this with consumers. Uh, we already started uh, with uh, pilots. Uh, we have 10 that we focus on, but we have 300 that they were created on our studio. And the plan is to give this technology to people that are not technical. So to bundle a lot of the heavy lifting, uh, social recovery, uh, fee abstraction, ERC-20, like basically give this as a building block uh, for local operators. Uh, and we're launching in uh, several places uh, uh, um, uh, at once, uh, just to show the versatility of this uh, software stack. So the plan is to, um, uh, to launch this in uh, uh, in Peru, where they are doing the first Peruvian stablecoin, um, uh, ESOL, uh, that is going to be on Ethereum. But naturally, people that want to use it are not Ethereum users. Uh, those are mainstream people. Uh, and they want to digitize their national currency and give away to onboard and, and use it and buy maybe dollar with it and basically hold dollars without being exposed to any volatile assets without be, being speculators or just, you know, avoid the uh, inflation without dealing with Bitcoin, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of options you can deliver and people don't necessarily need a, need a bank account. So we have pilots like that in South Africa, in Peru, in Singapore, um, uh, in Spain and in Italy and uh, uh, UK, we have pilots that uh, use this for different incentives that they want to give on a local level. Uh, local operators, sports teams that can use it uh, as a wallet for paying for stuff at stadiums, supporting uh, players, um, doing digital vouchers instead of uh, going through Visa and payment cards, uh, uh, playing with AMMs uh, on, a, on a use case that, um, for instance, one of our companies that builds on Fuse called Seedbed, they're doing uh, microcredit using AMMs. Uh, and they're launching this in South Dakota with the Lakota tribe, and it's powered by Dai. So the whole point is to to abstract away all the all the um, gas, all the public keys, uh, verification time, transaction finality. Like make it so the experience is more like Venmo, WeChat, um, pay, uh, Cash App, stuff like that. So uh, this is really um, uh, the product. Uh, and right now we. Uh, um, of course, uh, selling an idea like that and telling investors we're going to kill Visa and we're going to outcompete Stripe. Uh, and uh, the way we're doing it is by building it uh, 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 open source. Usually, uh, uh, they don't like this pitch. So uh, uh, Fuse is uh, using a token to build an ecosystem uh, and to make sure that this is staying uh, free. And there's no one company that makes all the money from the data or from the fees or from uh, uh, selling the code. Um, so this is why uh, the ecosystem itself can replace Visa. One company cannot. This is why we need to bring more uh, companies to this. So already Fuse is uh, um, uh, operated by 70 validators. Uh, you need the, it's a DPoS token. Uh, it's bridged to mainnet, but it's a separate blockchain. 
And the, the idea is to, uh, uh, we never did a, a, a sale, a, a token sale before. So we only raised in equity so far from several VCs. Uh, the plan is to, to do a public distribution and we thought there's no better place than Mesa. So uh, um, avoid from risk and uh, like several different uh, problems with the uh, IDOs uh, that are tackled with uh, Mesa. But also we wanted to do um, a sort of collaboration with Mesa and uh, give out uh, 250,000 tokens in a way that allows you to participate in Fuse. Uh, we can discuss the, the details uh, and maybe post another uh, blog post or, or, or suggestion and, and hear what your thoughts. But the idea is to loan 150K uh, tokens so you can run a node and participate in the governance directly, not through delegation. So just to understand uh, governance on Fuse works very different than um, then with uh, DXDAO, it's really a DPoS uh, sidechain uh, with a Tezos uh, um, um, kind of a governance system implemented on top of it using Solidity. So it has staking, it has delegation, every decision to upgrade the network is voted on. So even stuff like updating fees is something that requires a vote. Um, naturally, like the legal entity that manages it is not the Israeli company. It's the Gibraltar entity, and the, the, the goal is to actually have um, a, a, a way for the community to decide what to do with, uh, uh, with the tokens, not only decide about upgrades in the network. So basically turn the governance uh, to the hands of the token holders. So this is really um, a different narrative. It's not yield farming. It's not exactly DeFi. It's using Ethereum to uh, outcompete Visa uh, and bring mainstream audience. In, in the millions to, to this space. So that's uh, Fuse, and happy to hear your thoughts. I think it was 10 minutes. I'm not sure. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, thank you for presenting. Does anybody have questions for Mark? We have a couple of minutes before we can move to the next one. I have a question. Sure. Uh, the Peru stablecoin, will it be the official one or like is it? Uh... Yeah, yeah, okay. we're going to announce it and uh, and uh, who we're working with in a few weeks, but uh, they're also an investor. It's a big player in the Peruvian crypto space and uh, they're also a custodian and they're going to do a Peruvian version of USDC, uh, one of the first stablecoins in South America. And, and it's really exciting because uh, they have inflation problems, uh, they have different countries that need this also, so we can definitely see uh, several other stable coins following their footsteps. Okay, exciting. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, it would be awesome to talk uh, later when you guys have uh, all the, I mean, if you can share later on the, on the developer course uh, next week, maybe uh -huh. how your technical requirements of your governance. Maybe there can be some cross collaboration there where we yeah. can, I don't know, share reputation against uh, between other organizations. That's something that we are looking for to integrate with our governance protocols. So if you can join the next uh, weekly DEPCON uh, next week and, and give a short technical overview about how it works. Yeah, uh, that would be awesome. No, I, I would be I would be very happy to to talk about it. Uh, uh, what what's cool about Tezos and we're a big fans of of Tezos is that you can actually give the the economic majority of the protocol uh, power to to change uh, uh, to basically decide stuff, uh, which is very different than Bitcoin and Ethereum. So for, so for base layers, uh, this is definitely the best way to to avoid conflict and and to to move stuff. Um, and uh, also to stabilize the price, like there's a lot of, uh, of uh, pros, uh, but also now seeing, uh, seeing it from the inside and watching like the, the ecosystem grows, um, definitely there's a lot of things we can help get help from you. Like governance is really something like it's uncharted territory. There's a lot to discover. Very good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and yeah, and sorry again about the confusion on the governance call and looking forward to continuing sure. the conversation. Yeah. 
So one one last uh, one last sentence is that we want to do a mesa sale in about a month. So uh, following on this is uh, is like the process. We will um, uh, do the the voting on the um, like the voting proposal, and I think that's it. Like everything else is set from our side. Great, great, great. And yes, and um, and you're in the key base as well to kind of work through any details and follow up. Yeah, I'll I'll add myself there. Awesome. Cool. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay, Jay Chung, do you want to uh, take the stage next? Talk a little bit about crypto locally. Take ten minutes. Hey, sure. Yeah. Let me put on my camera. Hey. Um. So I'm Jay from Crypto Locally. And uh, basically, I wanted to talk about potentially listing slash IDOing our project on Mesa. So um, just to give you guys a little bit of a background on Crypto Locally, um, we started around a year ago and um, our team actually were block producers uh, for EOS. And we did that for like around a year. And um, while we were doing that with the funds that we actually made from being a validator on EOS, we started building EOS locally. So it's like local Bitcoins, but um, basically using smart contract escrows in order to uh, do non-custodial fiat uh, crypto trading. And then um, we realized that we could basically apply the same model to multiple chains. So uh, we worked with Binance and got Binance Chain on there as soon as they launched, um, and then Tron, and then moved to Ethereum recently as well. Um, and with the whole DeFi craze coming along, we um, actually had a bunch of investors and advisors that were uh, telling us that we should actually also build in like a gateway to DeFi within the platform. So we built this thing called a finance wallet where people can buy crypto and immediately just one click, just start earning interest through our platform. So um, we actually launched that last week. Um, by the way, if you want to check the website out, it's cryptolocally.com. Um, and it's been around for a while. It has around 15,000 plus users. And we've been growing pretty quickly around like 50% more in volume and users each month on average. Um, so basically give the token we integrated into our platform in June and it's a utility token that gives you discounts on the exchange for now um, and so on. But you can also earn interest and um, get a bunch of different perks from it. But the biggest thing is that we're um, trying to actually make crypto locally into something similar like a DAO. Um, we're going to make give a governance token and people will be able to vote on which tokens can be listed. Essentially, they'll be able to manage uh, most of the platform, basically. And we're trying to sort of um, really apply the mindset of being uh, non-custodial, as in we actually never touch the users as fiat and neither do we touch their crypto, really. Um, because everything goes through a smart contract escrow. Um, and in terms of our roadmap, we're uh, building in something similar to Wiren uh, Vault cross-chain for our finance wallet. So since we've integrated so many different protocols already, we're trying to integrate DeFi for all those protocols as well. Um, and yeah, like our, our real mission is to uh, make crypto and DeFi accessible to anyone. Like, no mom or dad is going to go and figure out yield farming. Um, and like people that are undocumented, people that are unbanked still have no access to crypto. Like we're very far away from actually crossing that gap to mass adoption. And we're trying to make that easier and allow people to be able to access everything in one place. So yeah, that, that's a brief intro. Um, and to talk a bit about, uh, Mesa and what we want to do. So basically, we launched Give on Bet2, like Binance Chain, for um, because we were working with Binance and they um, let us launch the token there for free. Um, and then we recently um, started doing a lot of marketing for our IDO, and our investors were saying that it would be, probably be best to move to ERC20. So we did that, and we're going to open up a swap to ERC-20 um, with the IDO um, 
just to give some context, only 1% of Give is in the circulating supply. And that was because we had to airdrop it to the Binance chain community a year ago when they launched, like when we issued it there. Um, but no other Give has actually been like unlocked. And uh, we finished our private sale around two weeks ago. Um, and we're planning to do the public sale on the 28th of September. That's sort of the date that we have in mind right now. So yeah, um, I guess that's the skinny of it. If you guys have any questions. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, and does anyone have questions for Jay? And Jay, are you also in Keybase? We could uh, to kind of run yeah. down any details here. There's yeah. A Mesa, there's a Mesa channel in, in Keybase. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're already in there. Yep, I'm on it. Awesome. Well, if no one has questions, um, I mean, you could say, you know, just a couple more minutes if you want, but otherwise, like, thanks for thanks for joining and presenting. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to sort of present it in the group. And uh, I did create the Alchemy proposal link and so on. Um, so, yeah. We're, we are also going to do something similar to DIA, where we're, we actually fork the uh, front end, and we're creating a separate um, subdomain where the sale will also be on our site. But we thought that it would be great if we could also get a MESA listing on that UI. So yeah. Can I ask what, what, was, the, uh, what was the thinking behind the, the fork UI? Um, yeah, so basically, uh, I, I just saw that the ETH.link um, URL was kind of unstable the last couple of days. So um, I, like, I think I'd feel more comfortable if there was a backup option that I just create myself. Yeah, that's understandable. It's been a source of frustration for uh, those of us in the DXDAO community with the eat that link and hopefully something will get figured out to make that more stable. It's kind of ridiculous, honestly. Um, but yeah, people are, are thinking about it and making plans. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Do you, you think as a, as a general population, we should, we should stop talking about the dot link and like make sure people just use Omen.eth with MetaMask, like we—that's what everyone should be using, maybe instead of dot link. So we can like start that, yeah. Yeah, I personally think that is actually a great idea, just to make sure we are not um, getting comfortably with centralized services again. Uh, there's a chance that we will have control of our own infrastructure, so we could make sure that shit is running if we need it. And then we can like rely on st uh, like centralized stuff. But for now, it's like, yeah, we should probably like we should even change uh, like redirects to dot uh, eth if the UI ch uh, knows that there is MetaMask. So we actually like uh, do uh, as much as we can to not rely on eth dot uh, link anymore. Well, if, yeah, yeah, we'll save it for another call. Yeah, this is a deep, deep, but important, pressing kind of topic that we should, we should figure out. Uh, it's obviously pretty important. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks, Jay. Thanks for uh, presenting and looking forward to the conversation getting continued. And uh, we've got about 10 minutes left in the call. And so typically we cover the uh, kind of like recap the, Biz Dev and governance calls. Um, Ingemar, do you do you kind of want to give a quick recap of Biz Dev here? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so, oh yeah, D Hedged and ALN, uh, Luna Social are are now on Mesa. Um, what else? There's the swap article that's in final review, and I'll have that. Uh, published and submitted in Hacker Noon. I guess it seems like that's over. Uh, AL proposed a report on DXDAO, made a cut on it. Uh, and I think it would be cool to do. I think if some, uh, like if directionally we were aligned with how that was done, I think it I think it would be cool to have that. 
Um, and I am working on a sort of like marketing uh, department uh, proposal, like with idea in mind of like what the general KPIs would be for the DXDAO, uh, who who would be in this department, and what are they managing, and where could we see like a content calendar or like a like media events content calendar. So that's that's in the works. Um, Thanks, thanks, Ingemar. Um, Gusto, anything to add on the dev side? We kind of covered the product so sometimes there's not a lot to add. I mean, I think the one thing we didn't touch on is there's work going on uh, for governance stuff, like uh, the ERC20 guild. Um, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, about that we can give a short update. Um, we have a... Um, we have guys from Block Rocket. It's called. It's like a contractor that is working for DXL, writing the test for the ERC20 guild, which is going very good. And then, yes, a lot of work is being done on the governance front, where we are going to have the um, a new DXL governance test, uh, testing how the how, how can we say infrastructure deploy on, on Rinkeby. Yeah. Uh, Nyla, did you want to say something? I, I don't know who's, whether you're joking or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. Okay. Um, just to follow up also like on the XDAI DAO or the reputation mapping that we're trying to do, um, I'll repost it. Maybe I'll create a poll or I'm not sure how to do that, but we have two options basically for the reputation mapping. One is kind of like fast and it involves... Um, so I'm not going to get into the problem, but... Um, yeah, we have two options. Uh, I can share the uh, link to this again. Uh, one is to import the, uh, to export the private key from the contract wallet into a regular wallet. And the other one is to uh, have everyone who's using a Gnosis safe or a contract wallet sign a, uh, send a transaction on mainnet. Um, these are kind of like the two options for reputation mapping. And yeah, ideally we can get that uh, moving soon. Um, so we can have, um, Another DAO one next day. Good, good stuff, and nice to hear with seven hundred GUI gas prices. So, uh, Chris, do you want to kind of recap the governance call? Yeah, um, we have a recording uh, which I think is like thirty views. So people have been checking out the kind of great conversation yesterday, which was uh, kind of uh, entirely focused on the uh, recommendations or suggestions from Delphi. Um, I thought it sparked a lot of good conversations from a lot of people here, so I would uh, kind of go and, and, and check out check out that call if you uh, have time. Um, I think broadly speaking, there's a you know there's a lot of things that you know Dick Stow was working on and governance and things that we're we're trying to flesh out and develop a uh, solutions to um, to to kind of address these, um, but. Right now, it's kind of hard because there's so much that's going on uh, that it's hard to kind of see this and understand the different things that are that are working. So I think we need to do a better job of communicating at a higher level um, rather than just kind of the the back and forth that we're doing. Even speaking, you know, thinking about Rails, which is like hearing everyone talk about Rails today it was like so <laughs> awesome and like hearing all the progress there. But clearly, I think that's not something that we have disseminated throughout the community. So I think that's like, you know, something we can do, especially uh, on the governance side. Um, thinking about kind of that and trying to, uh, I don't know if I'm doing a post or framing things of the different initiatives in really like three buckets. Um, one is like governance that's happening now, right? That's like, okay, we need to vote on a proposal. We need to um, uh, signal something on, on this, something that will happen right now in the existing governance system. Governance 1.x, which is improvements that we can make to the current system, like structural improvements. So something like the DXD um, ERC20 guild. And then the third is governance 2.0. So this is kind of like wholesale changes to how DXDAO uh, is governed. And that's where uh, some of the conversation yesterday 
on the Delphi call was uh, centered on. And I think we all are in agreement of how important that long-term alignment and thinking about um, the whole host of things um, like layer two, uh, kind of aligning DXD and, and rep holders. I think it's really important we have that conversation and keep that going while also not taking away from the daily or the weekly kind of workings of things that need to get done and also improvements that we can have uh, in the short term. So um, yeah, uh, I would check out the call and uh, good for, for kind of framing that conversation. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And I think it's a great point that you know information can be disseminated better at a higher level. I think similarly, product roadmaps are something that are in the works and are forthcoming. And ultimately, all of this really should be condensed into a new landing page update, which I think will also be forthcoming. Um, of course, there's growing but still somewhat limited and overburdened dev capacity. So I think if you know, bear bear with. The devs here and a lot of this stuff is is going to be done um just and just yeah. one, one one more thing i think on that is i do think we have an opportunity now um uh, i think some of these things will be like both monthly and quarterly are good opportunities to kind of like initiate these like retrospective like updates or roadmaps so october october 1st would be kind of the start of q4 so i'm thinking about this specifically for the rep distribution um, and how that kind of conversation is had. It might be an opportunity to be like, okay, let's look at what we did over the last three months uh, and make that a regular regular thing. Um, so um, I'm thinking about that specifically as we turn over to the beginning of the month and a new quarter here. Absolutely, and, and before we close here, I just wanna highlight that uh, on the Alchemy side of things, the DXDAO manifesto is is up for ratifications, currently got 27.6% for, 0% against with 10, 10 parties voting. Um, pending boosting is also the five point plan proposal, which was on Dow Talk and sort of lays the groundwork to, to you know, basically a signal that the DXDAO hears a lot of the concerns around a few things, you know, the government's alignment that you just talked about, Chris, and also uh, the fact that you know, some DXD holders are dissatisfied with the bonding curve. I mean, these things are being heard. Uh, the solutions aren't quick. They're, this stuff needs to be uh, done deliberately and with uh, analysis and intention. So I just wanted to highlight those. And unless anybody else has closing comments, we're at the hour and, you know, covered all the products, the calls, and had two guest speakers. So not bad. Congrats to Uniswap on Uni Launch. <laughs> Everybody uh, combing combing the desert for your old wallets that may have even. I love that they gave uh, it to people who even didn't actually succeed in interacting with the country. There was twelve thousand addresses. Twelve thousand addresses that failed to interact with Uniswap now have. Uh, you yeah. <laughs> but I, I agree with the gusto too. It's kind of. It's making me excited just being on this call and hearing everything. We're it's excited for kind of things going forward. So it should be good. Yeah. It's exciting because you know, I think they there's very little thought has gone into the governance yet, and that's what we've been preparing right. for. So to me, the field is wide open for DX now, now and uh, now's the time. And we're on it. People are on it, the community is on it, and uh here we are, right at the hour. So thanks everybody. Um have a good day. See you next week. Same same time, same channel. See you. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.